Well, good evening. It's great to be speaking with you today and looking at this little three-week series um, in 1 Corinthians 13 and considering these wonderful verses. And I'm sure you've all heard them before. I'm sure you've heard them multiple times. And uh, we've titled this little series, Love Is. And to be honest, every time I've heard us say that, a bit of a confession, I've wanted to break into that famous wet, wet, wet song, Love Is All Around Me. You know the one. I feel it in my fingers, I feel it in my toes. Beautiful, guys. Wonderful karaoke song. Let's go do that together as a church. I think that'll be fantastic. Um, but we've broken this little passage into chunks these past few weeks and taken a brief time to look at the characteristics of what love is what they mean for our relationships, and not just romantic ones, but all relationships, friends, family, colleagues, neighbors, strangers, people we meet, see on the bus, people we meet on the street. I'm sure I could go on and on of the many different relationships. And today we're looking at verses 6 to 8, and um, the context, just briefly, in case you haven't been with us, is Paul, whilst he was out in Ephesus, hears about bad reports of the behavior of the believers in Corinth. And not just that, he then receives a letter from them asking advice on how to live a Christian life. So Paul writes this letter in response to these two things to the Corinthians. And the first half of the letter of uh, 1 Corinthians, chapters 1 to 6, Paul warns them about their behavior. And then in the second half, chapter 7 to 16, Paul answers their questions on Christian living. And in particular for us today, chapter 13, talking about love and how we might love, how we might go about love, um, loving others and the love that we experience. And tonight, looking at verses 6 to 8, we read, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And those verses are so beautiful, aren't they? And part of me really hopes the Apostle Paul lets down his guard of humility just for a second after writing that and just as he finishes went, my word, that's good. And then he went back to being full of modesty and continued his letter to the Corinthians. But in reality, We know Paul, and he understood what he was writing, and he wouldn't allow himself to go over, go away from his humble demeanor. Paul was full of love. He even heeds that warning that he gives at the start of uh, chapter 13 in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. But Paul is no gong, he's no symbol, but he is full of love, full of love in action and in word. And his writings, the ones that we've read this evening and many of his writings have stood the test of time and they feel as relevant today as they ever did and they feel as relevant for Christians and for those across the world. And we only need look at verse six and wonder how that plays out in our world at the moment. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. The actions of Russia on Thursday shocked Ukraine and the world. We have seen innocent lives lost in acts of evil, acts of aggressive brutality. And do we sit potentially on the edge of another world war? This is not love. But we hope. We hope and we pray for truth to be spoken into this situation, for other world leaders to stand up for what is right, to stand together in unity and love, that these world leaders might stand in God's strength and compassion. And I know this talk wants to focus in on relationships and try and be as specific as possible for our own relationships, but it felt poignant and important to consider the relations on a macro level, and for us to pray into these relationships, for it's only in Jesus Christ, so aptly named the Prince of Peace, that we might see change, that we might see reconciliation, that we might see love permeating throughout the world. That is our hope. That is our prayer. But we can have our part to play too. 
Many of you might have heard of Martin Niemöller. He was a minister in, the, in Nazi Germany, and he famously spoke, out, spoke in his regret of not standing up for people during the Nazi regime. And he's quoted as saying, first, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Jesus so often came to speak for other people or to speak up for them, to speak to them. Look at the woman caught in adultery, about to be stoned to death, and Jesus comes and challenges the Pharisees. Or blind Bartimaeus, who is shushed and shunned and put away by the crowds, and Jesus makes a beeline for him. Chooses to go out of his way to go over to him and heal him. Jesus was predisposed to love anyone and everyone, irrespective of age, race, gender, or status. That is who he is. And whilst this little bit might not be specific of a relationship that we hold, it does matter in light of how we relate to people and how we love people. But what of our own relationships in light of this? This has maybe got you thinking about the conflicts in your own lives. Evil in this context might seem like a bit of a harsh word um, to considering our own relationships, but maybe it's better to think of that as unkind, hurtful, or maybe on the edge of cruel. We are all human. We carry the weight of sin in our lives. And as such, we are selfish. We fall out. We disagree. We annoy people. We let others down. But love is the antidote to all of this conflict. Love is the antidote to all of these issues. It's the way to resolution and reconciliation. And often that begins with the truth. And there are many different guises that we can take thinking about truth. Being honest with someone how you feel when you're dating them. Not leading someone on, but maybe also thinking about how you might be truthful in how you're pursuing someone. Being truthful with a friend whether that's on your own side, sharing your feelings, what's getting you down, what are the lows in your life? Or maybe being able to ask the difficult questions of a friend, to challenge them. I know in my life I've benefited so much from people who tell me the truth. I love people who are blunt with me, straight to the point, and I've been blessed with that with my family, with my wife Jude, and with many close friends. And can I encourage you, if you don't have those people, Find them. Tell the people you love, tell the people who love you to be honest with you. Or go out and find a prayer triplet. People who you can share the high highs and the low lows with. I've been so incredibly blessed by those people. Those people who have journeyed with me through every situation of life. They've cried with me, they've laughed with me, we've worshipped together. And we've brought everything together before God. And encouraged and welcomed him into every situation of our lives. But with the truth, what about admitting when we're wrong? Does anyone like doing that? It's so tough. We love being right. We love winning arguments and debates, even in the most inane of topics. But at what cost? Yes, there's a space for a healthy, loving debate or argument. But what if we were more interested in winning people rather than arguments? What kind of message would that give in our relationships? That we love them more than ourselves? That we love them more than our own pride? That we love them more than the need to be right? And the same might be true retrospectively. Going back and admitting we were wrong rather than holding on to something. And this might require a bit of work. This might require real courage to admit to ourselves that we're wrong before we can admit to anyone else. This isn't going to be easy, but it could be totally and utterly transformative for you and for the other person. And today, that might take some prayer. That might take real prayer to ask for the courage to do this, for the bravery to swallow our pride, to tell the truth, And to go out and win people because we love them more than ourselves. That was verse 6. But what of verse 7? 
It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You might have heard this in a different version of scripture. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And can I encourage you to to go home? I'm going to look at this as a bit of a set together. I'm going to call it the always set. But can I encourage you to go home and look at these even more deeply? They're so rich. Go home and study these pieces of scripture. But I'm going to refer to them as always. Because this love is not born out of conditions. We will love sometimes or we love when we receive something in return. No, this is love no matter what the circumstances Love that always is. The desire to love is no new thing. In this way, it's no new thing. If you're married or ever been to a wedding, you'll have heard people make vows. And not just vows that say, I love you in a kind of mushy way, but vows that say, I will love you no matter the consequence. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death us do part. When Jude and I got married, our MC, my friend Stuart, got up and said, you know, Jude and Marcus are married, and it's wonderful. But as they vowed, for better, for worse, I thought, in many ways, that describes them. I mean, Marcus couldn't do any better. And Jude, well, she really couldn't do any worse. <laughs> Cheeky kid. <clears throat> but these vows are a desire. They're a hope to love no matter what we get in return. A desire to love always. And they're a reflection of how Jesus loves. We aspire to get there. And I know that we might not always get there. And I know it hasn't been everyone's experiences. And marriages don't work out for a variety of reasons. Irreconcilable differences. And that's okay. We are human. We are not Jesus. We're not capable of fulfilling these all of the time. But there's no guilt and shame in these. There's no guilt and shame whatsoever because Jesus has enough love for each and every one of us. His love is always. But taking those four attributes, they're always set. They almost come as pairs to protect and persevere and to trust and to hope. To protect is to look after people. The man who is filled with love takes time with people, even those who are maybe difficult or they have their weaknesses, those who are different, those who are struggling. And this is the type of love that can persevere even in the most tough of times. It doesn't give up when you are struggling. It doesn't give up when someone around you is struggling. This could be your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your friends, your family. This kind of love keeps on going. But loving in this way will also lead to trust and to hope. Trusting in people to come through for you. Trusting in them to be there and support you. And hoping for them. Hope for their welfare. Hope for their success. Hope for their happiness. Hope for their hearts and their character. This kind of love is shown so perfectly in the story of the prodigal son. The father who gives his son his inheritance and the boy goes off and he lives, lives it out, spends it all in wild living. But the father stands at the gate every day, hoping against hope, trusting that his son will come back, believing for the best that his boy will make good decisions. And then he does. He returns to him and the father embraces him and protects him and loves him because he's always loving him. And as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking how amazing, firstly, if we as individuals could inhabit these attributes, these always attributes in our own relationships. But even more than that, I was thinking, what if we as a church were known for these qualities? A big family who love people no matter what, who protect, who trust, who hope, who persevere, who look for the best in people, who keep them going even in the mess of life, who always hope for the best. And we could get there, couldn't we? It might take time, it might take effort, but how amazing would that be? And it would come through investing in each other and joining in groups and serving with and for each other. 
It involves things like focus, going away together as a big family to build those relationships, to worship together, to come and know God better together. How incredible would it be to be a part of that family, that family that was known for love? It's no shock when we read all of these attributes and think through all these characteristics of love that Paul finishes this section in verse 8 by saying, love never fails. Love in this way would never fail. And the love that Paul has described is definitely what we should be aspiring to in our relationships. But unfortunately, we will fall short. We're human. We can be selfish, irritable, disagreeable. We get tired and emotional. We get run down and burnt out. But this love that we have just looked at for these past three weeks is manifest in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus personifies all of these qualities of love and his love has never and will never fail. And we get to know and experience this love through Jesus' action on the cross. In those verses in 1 John 4, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. As Emily shared this evening, we just had a little baby girl, uh, Ruby, um, and we became parents for the first time. Forgive me for telling a story about my child, um, but everyone says that whenever you become a parent, you experience love in a new way. And they were absolutely, totally right. I have to admit, I was blown away by how much I love Ruby. I held her for the first time, and I just knew that I loved her. And she hadn't done anything. In fact, she does very little. <laughs> but I love her more than words can describe. And it's enabled me to understand the love of God, the love of the Father in an even greater way. For the amount that I love Ruby, and that's a lot, it doesn't even scratch the surface of how much God loves us. I will fail, I'll get angry or frustrated, I'll get impatient with her or irritable, but God won't. Jesus won't. Their love won't fail. They love us. They love me, they love you. They love all of humanity. And it's not built on any condition, anything that we might do. And in fact, sometimes we want to push God away. We want to go our own way. We can be selfish and unkind. And though we still might have sin in our lives, God still loves us. And he never stops loving us. Can I say that again? God will never stop loving us, loving you, loving me, loving all of humanity in this world. Because that is who he is. We read those verses in Romans that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor nothing else in all creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the love that God has. That is the love that will never fail. God loves you. And that's what I want you to know more than anything else today. God loves you. Maybe you've never heard that before. Maybe you've never felt it before. But I just want you to know that tonight. God loves you. And he has always loved you. And he will always love you. From now until eternity. <laughs>